The following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Getting up and running. So talking about getting up and running, let's, you know, let's take a step back here a little bit and talk about, I think, the trajectory that a lot of us here in this business took to get into this business, it was a pretty, it was pretty much the dominant path. You know, a lot of us came here. Uh, I came from uh, the East Coast. A lot of guys came from local Chicagoans, and you took this this same path. You know, maybe you started off as a runner, or maybe a clerk. You found some firm to invest some time and money and resources in you to train you uh, a laborious and expensive process. And then if you if you passed the muster with them. Uh, they would put you on a badge, they would put up some capital behind you, and you would become either a market maker or even a broker. And that was kind of it. That was kind of the way most people uh, got into this business. And it was a great path. Uh, let's not deny it. It was pretty much for, in terms of learning pure risk management, in terms of learning the mechanics of the options business, there really was no better way to do it. But of course, it wasn't exactly without its flaws. It was a pretty difficult path to get into. If you didn't know somebody, it was hard to get into it. And also, it was expensive. The firm had to put capital behind you and time and resources to train you. Uh, so it was uh, difficult to get into. And let's, let's face it, too, the actual place where you were doing your day-to-day -day business uh, wasn't the friendliest place in the world. So it wasn't suitable uh, for a very broad audience of people. And also, a question arose, a lot of people that we're going to discuss a lot today, and that is, you know, we're getting this very specialized training in risk management uh, what can I do with that that is outside the floor? And I think we're going to have some interesting answers for that today. And of course, you know, uh, that trajectory has, has changed a bit uh, over the past 10 years or so. People used to come in, uh, they spent a lot of time, sometimes multiple years training. Uh, then, you know, back at the heyday, they would wait probably several months uh, for the privilege of paying exorbitant sums to lease a seat uh, and get out there on the floor. And that was, that was, there was a big influx at that time. That has very much shifted now. We're seeing more of an exodus uh, away from the trading floor and away from the trading screen. Now, why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons I go into. We're going to hit on a few of them here. Uh, first off, of course, you know the bid-ask spread, kind of the lifeblood of the liquidity provider, the market maker. Um, that's what you get. That's what you're paid to uh, to take the risk to stand out there uh, to make a two-sided market. And that risk premium, that lifeblood, has really kind of been drained out of the marketplace over the past the better part of the past uh, decade or so. Now, there are some pluses to that, obviously. The reduced spread leads to a little bit lower friction, a little bit lower transaction costs for customers. That's helped on the retail end. Uh, but at the same time, that reduced spread also increases the risk for the guys actually out there standing out there making markets. Uh, and that pressure, that pressure to reduce that spread really came uh, from a wide variety of factors, one of the leading ones, of course, being uh, the dramatic growth of electronic execution. We're going to get into some stats in a second. Uh, but essentially, the, the overall percentage of the contracts we've seen electronic, electronically executed, not just on the pitch, but moving through these different systems, you know, starting with raise and then kind of going on all the way up through all these different systems over the years, uh, has dramatically increased. Again, there have been upsides to that. More efficiency, more access to more customers, more participants could come in and play in the space. That is a good thing. Uh, but of course, also, from a physical perspective, it dramatically reduced the impact of actually standing somewhere, being a physical presence in a pit. And of course, with that increasing number of participants comes increasing efficiencies and, of course, further pressure on the bid-ask spread. Uh, I was talking to uh, my buddies over there at Trade Alert. We'll hear a little bit more from Henry in a little bit. Uh, and he put together this great slide. Just, this is just the past few years. This is from 2010 till now, just showing you not just ADV, which is the red, uh, but also just the general trend of overall, this is equity options here, uh, options, uh, electronic execution. And you can see the trend has been dramatically up, particularly in the past year and a half or so. Uh, we were hovering around the low 20s uh, back in January 2010, and now fast forward, 
uh, a couple of years, and now we're cut, get closing in on 35 percent overall. I know a lot of people have said to me over the years, "Well, you know, I'm in a I'm in a product that might be a little bit more resilient. I'm in a bit of a safe harbor. I'm in some of the futures and futures options related to products that have withstood. That they've had a little bit more inertia on the trading floor." And I saw this uh, the other day put out by our friends at the CME, and I thought this is if this is not emblematic of the trend. I don't know what is. Uh, this is WTI, a product, if you're familiar with it, you know, it isn't really traditionally electronic friendly. And this just goes back to Jan of 09. Just a few, this isn't a decade, this is just a few years as well. And you see the percentage of electronic execution in WTI was, was nominal. It was somewhere south of 10% uh, in Jan of 09. And here we are, fast forward. In August, they just hit a record for uh, first time ever, 50% of their, uh, excuse me, 50% of their volume was electronically executed over there. Of course, with all this new access, a lot more people getting into the game, particularly on the exchange side. I debated with this chart of adding all the ins and outs and who acquired who and who sold who, who got in and out. I figured we'd be here for half an hour if I did that. So the general trend, you can see, is upward. And uh, it's been, we've gone from a handful back a decade ago to a dozen now, which uh, has led, of course, to one of the chief complaints by a lot of uh, participants in the marketplace these days, uh, fragmentation. And we're seeing, you know, this electronic access we've seen is we had these dedicated centers of liquidity back in the, if you look at that chart again, back when we were back over here, the exchanges were essentially uh, not-for-profit public utilities. They were dedicated essentially to the purpose of providing liquidity. Fast forward to today, and now we have these exchanges that are all essentially for-profit or public and the, the dedicated source of liquidity has maybe taken a back seat uh, to some of the other, the other needs that we're seeing arising in the marketplace from investors, from analysts, uh, and things like that. And this liquidity that was once centered in a handful of places, uh, you know, SIBO, a few others, Amex, is now spread across a dozen exchanges. And we've really entered what I like to refer to as the niche exchange era. We're seeing a lot of entrants coming into the space now, not launching as these large centers of liquidity, but really they have a single... It could be a technology, it could be a business model, it could even be as simple as something as a rate. Uh, they're charging some rebate that's a different rebate schedule, and they're launching around that, and their goal is not to be you know, the next earth-shattering center of liquidity, but really to be a niche player, sub-5%, often sub-3% in the overall marketplace. And of course, not just fragmenting liquidity, but as you add all these players, the costs have gone up you know, nearly exponentially, connecting to all these exchanges, maintaining presences on all of these exchanges, uh, messaging, order routing, all that kind of stuff is expensive. Uh, you used to be able to have a handful of guys in the pit and maybe you were arguing back and forth to the CME or something like that. And that was really about the extent of it. Now with a dozen exchanges and everything else, uh, you've really added uh, quite a bit and quite a bit of cost uh, to that mix, mix. And I couldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this last one. Just over the last few months, I think we've all seen the dramatic uh, potential for all of these exchanges interoperating with each other and the potential for failures I'd be hard pressed to think over the past year of a single market center that hasn't had a relatively spectacular failing uh, over the past year. So that has added a new wrinkle, a new bit of risk uh, to the marketplace. This is another, sh another snapshot of it, uh, again, from uh, our buddies over at Trade Alert. This kind of just breaks it down in a little bit more uh, stark terms. Just over the past five years, not even a full decade, we've gone from seven exchanges to 12, so about 70% increase in the exchanges, dramatic increase in underlines, the overall number of contracts listed, the actual you know, strikes and series has doubled. So that, that's a dramatic increase just in terms of quoting all of that and the effort that goes into that. ADB has increased. We've seen that trumpeted a lot as that's a sign of health in the marketplace. And that surely is a, a positive thing. But you also notice here the average uh, number of trades has uh, increased, uh, but that has not perhaps kept pace. So what we've seen is the actual average trade size being about 25 contracts here, dropping to about 15 uh, in 2013. So that's been kind of interesting too, uh, to see that average lot size dropping. And of course here, for a lot of us uh, in the trading space, is the big key one. Uh, the messaging has pretty much almost gone up 400% in that same period. And just the cost of putting all those messages through and canceling and everything else and the routing that goes into that. Again, adding to uh, the cost and the risk associated with doing this. Of course, other things have kind of combined uh, to disenfranchise uh, the traditional trading path as well. We've seen what used to be essentially a sacrosanct thing, that bid offer spread. If you stood out there and made that market, you were protected in that no one could transact on that spread but you. Uh, that slowly vanished as the bid-ask spread has essentially vanished. 
And now, essentially, that protection is gone. So we've seen uh, internalized cross, whatever you want to call them, orders can go up pretty much anywhere on that bid ask spread, or who knows where else, and if their time stand is a little bit off. And what that leaves for the guys who are still out there, of course, is you know they're they're constantly referring to it as fighting over scraps, where the best orders are coming in, have already been picked over, and then they get to fight over what's essentially left. And these other little bits have just uh, just amounted to adding some salt in the wound. A lot of people are. We still see a lot of products these days with one-sided paper flow, particularly in some of the broad equities, where it's nothing but funds selling calls and buying puts, and that's pretty much uh, a difficult thing to deal around day after day. Uh, the days of day trading are pretty much coming to an end to be able to come in and go home flat. Uh, most people are really carrying positions much longer than they wanted to, uh, and that, of course, has all of its inherent risks as well. Uh, again, like I referred to before, the, the cherry-picked order flow, if you're taking all this expense and risk, to do this, and then you're getting essentially orders that have already been kind of processed and picked over. It's not exactly uh, a, a tantalizing prospect. And certainly uh, this, this concept of edge, I wanted to put this in here just because it seems like uh, you know, we were all taught to go out and look for edge, and it seems like that concept is kind of quaint and antiquated now. Uh, if there is any quote-unquote edge to be found in these marketplaces, uh, the number of hedges you have to do to lock it in is almost prohibitively expensive at this point. Uh, so the concept of edge it may still exist in certain products, but it's really uh, kind of coming to an end. This last one I threw in here too, it gets a lot of uh, you know, sturm and drong. I call it the, the white whale of the options market. This is the HFT stuff. A lot of people will say, hey, I have a friend whose brother or cousin works at some firm or knows some firm who made a ton of money in product X because they were flickering quotes. But then when you start digging down into that, uh, you realize there really isn't much, much meat there. Uh, so it gets a lot of noise about, about the HFT, but it hasn't really been uh, the big factor in options and derivatives that it has been, let's say, uh, the cash equities. Uh, so let's 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 uh, put it all together here. What is this trend we're talking about that kind of brings us all here today and helps uh, kind of drive the options alliance? Well, we see cars increasing electronic execution. Not on its face a bad thing, but it can have some uh, some detrimental side effects. Of course, that leads to the bid ask spread and a lot of contraction on the bid ask spread. In addition, we have a fragmentation across now a dozen centers of liquidity, which I think for everyone uh, has been uh, an issue, retail and institutional. That, of course, has led to a dramatically increasing cost structure. And this last one, important, you know, lack of access to quality order flow. If you don't have that, then what's the point of even doing it to begin with? And so all of this has kind of led to this kind of equation that isn't, isn't exactly favorable in the long term of rising costs and, and some growing risk and less reward. It's not exactly what you want for a long term sustainable business. And so that gets a lot of people to the reason we're here today, to discuss you know, the future of options trading, the future of this space. And for a lot of people in this space, the future is now looking beyond the trading floor, and beyond the trading screen. Uh, and a lot of these people who, who come up in this business and gained this very specific and unique skill set are now starting to look outside of the space and are actually outside of the trading floors, but still in the trading and financial services related area, and starting to apply those to some interesting uh, new areas. Uh, entrepreneurs overall and just new ventures really represent one of the fastest growing demographics in the derivatives market. If you go back a decade or so, you're really kind of hard pressed to, uh, to count many, even on one hand, that are really playing in that space. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, one of the reasons the Options Alliance exists is because uh, that's a very unique skill set you get from that, tra that trajectory we talked about, but it doesn't really prepare you for that much outside of it, certainly not for a building a, a business around it. And that's where the Options Alliance got its start. Uh, what is it? What are we talking about? What, is, what are we talking about here today? The Options Alliance really, um, it grew up kind of organically, really, around what I do with Insider. And I launched Insider in January of 07. Um, it wasn't long after that that I started fielding calls uh, from other guys who had been in similar circumstances to me. They were market makers. They were thinking about doing something else. They were thinking about starting a new business. And they would call me up with a question. They would say, hey, Mark, how did you do this? Or how did you do that? It was, it was a surprise to me because it wasn't something I sought out or, or advertised myself as. We were just a, a content destination. Uh, but clearly that resonated with the, with the core of this audience. And I started having a lot of one-off meetings with individual potential aspiring entrepreneurs in the space. And over the couple of years, those meetings grew more and more frequent. So finally, I sat down with some of the guys in this room and I said, you know what, we really should maybe put this together as a group so that A, people can benefit from each other's experience. Uh, B, it saves me a lot of time. I don't have one off meetings anymore. And, uh, and so that's kind of was the genesis of the Options Alliance. We had our first really kind of re kind of planning meeting in this format back uh, December of about almost two years ago now. So it's kind of come a long way from them, just a handful of the guys. And we created kind of a twofold mission for this group. 
uh, when we were starting about this group, it was really in the teeth of the MF Global, the PFGs, and all the other stuff really that were rocking this space and have continued to rock this space over the past couple of years. So we really wanted to have a twofold mission for this group. First off, that we thought that we could do better as a group and as an industry, putting a better face out to the world and show the world that you know not everyone in this space is a bunch of scammers and ripoff artists who's going to come out here and sell you about how to make a million dollars tomorrow if you just trade options in any market environment and that sort of thing. So we thought, first and foremost, we wanted to make sure everyone in this group uh, was a responsible actor. And then also to provide some opportunity for some of the growing ventures and opportunities in this space. Uh, so we put together a bunch of guys who are mostly entrepreneurs and operating in and around this space. They have interesting new startups dovetailing a lot of different areas and different ventures in this space. And we all kind of agreed to hold ourselves to a little bit of a higher standard in terms of having an Options Alliance membership agreement, and you can see all that kind of stuff uh, on the website. But really, through, through the collective efforts, we're really trying to put together something new here in the space. And I think it really is, uh, it's, it's time has come. The, this seems to be resonating with a lot of people in the space. And right now, we have five categories of members. Uh, we're adding to that list all the time, so if you come to me and say, hey, I'm doing this, uh, we don't have a category for it, let me know, maybe we'll add a category. Uh, but a lot of guys in our group right now fall into these five categories. Of course, financial advisor seems to be the holy grail of the options market these days. That's last asset manager. Of course, a lot of people going into risk management consulting or vendors, tech startups, that sort of thing that are derivatives related. Uh, a lot of people going into the publisher side as well and the media side, uh, broker dealer and small agency execution desks also becoming popular. And of course, educators, a lot of educators uh, floating around in the space as well. And again, we wanted to make sure this group it had some teeth, it had some relevance. It wasn't just another networking group. Those exist. If you want to do that, there's a lot of places you can go and put your business card in a bowl and have a networking thing and meeting. But this group, like I said, we really try to make sure it stands for something and that we hold ourselves to a little bit higher standard. So we have to make sure all of our early applicants are sponsored by an existing member in the group and then we have an approval process with our membership committee uh, to make sure, again, that we're not, you know, that if we're holding ourselves up to this higher standard, we're not letting people in who don't fit that standard in terms of, you know, being pop, being being uh, being circumspect with how they promote options, how they how they represent it to the public, and, and that sort of thing. And of course, they have to agree to our code of conduct, which which varies by that membership category. But essentially, you can boil it down uh, to one line, which is essentially to not promote options in any sort of irresponsible manner. Uh, I think we've all seen examples of that, too many examples of that, over the past uh, you know few years. Uh, so in the secondary mission of the Options Alliance, again, one of the reasons we're all here today, is to really become this home to foster entrepreneurship uh, in the options market. You know, like I said, coming and meeting with all these different firms and people in this space and seeing all these new businesses that we're launching, it, it occurred to me that there really was a unique need for this, in Chicago in particular, because we have this great group, this great skill set of risk management, of people who have this great skill set in this space, and yet when you see all the entrepreneurship and startup endeavors in Chicago, they're all essentially trying to mimic Silicon Valley. They're all little tech startups. And nothing really seemed to speak to this audience. And so that's kind of where uh, this, uh, this group launched. And we have a lot of great, unique expertise you know, in the group. A lot of people really doing uh, some interesting things. Which, if you're uh, an aspiring options entrepreneur, if you're even just thinking about that kind of thing in the space, you can come in and actually learn from people who are actually doing it, you know, warts and all, our successes and our failures. You can see, you know, what we took from the floor and what we didn't, and what was able to work and what didn't work. And that's been a great process, I know, for me, meeting all of you guys and talking to you and sounding out ideas. And I know if you guys come in and become more active, then you can certainly uh, benefit from as well. And it's, it's kind of become a unique thing as well in that we have a lot of people in the group who are actually competitors, and yet they come together in this group uh, to help foster business amongst all of us, so to help themselves and their competitors grow. And also, again, because they, they buy into the mission of really trying to present a better face uh, for the options market. So it's been a great group. It's been a fantastic, uh, fun ride to see it grow. We already have people, members, you know, started off as this little Chicago-based thing, people dial in. People are coming in to talk today from New York. People are, uh, you know, we people dial in from uh, internationally now to our meetings. Uh, so it's, it's, it's grown quite a bit uh, just in the past year or so. And it's been exciting to see it get uh, to this point. So just to kind of wrap it all up while we're here today, uh, you know, this, this marketplace as a whole has really entered uh, a new era. And the old way of doing business, the old way a lot of us got into this business and got trained, uh, it's kind of going the way of the dodo. And so if we want to stay relevant, if we want to keep this skill set here located in these centers of financial industry, then we need to evolve with it. 
Uh, and so uh, for a lot of us, really, the entrepreneurs, it really seems to represent a lot of the future of what this marketplace has to hold. And you guys can join us uh, if you want to by joining the Options Alliance. A lot of our members are entrepreneurs, but we're not limited to entrepreneurs. So if you want to come in and help share your expertise or just support that idea of fostering entrepreneurship or, of course, showing that the, industry, the derivatives world can indeed is not full of scammers, we can hold ourselves to a higher standard. If that stuff resonates with you, then by all means, we have some applications in the back. We also you can serve on over to optionsalliance.org. The website's still very much in beta, uh, but it'll give you a lot of the information you need. And you can, of course, we have monthly meetings. Uh, you can swing by those or dial in. I know a lot of you guys have dialed in and uh, join us there. So without further ado, we're going to have, I'm going to welcome up, up my panelists for the next uh, session. And while we do that, actually, I'm going to just, uh, while we're getting uh, people up here, I'm going to show you a quick, if I can get it to work. Uh, here we go. A quick video uh, about uh, what we're doing over there at the Option Alliance. All right. <laughs> Dramatic loss of customer confidence over the past few years. We've seen a dramatic decline in options volume as a result of that loss of confidence. It's clear that the industry as a whole can hold itself to a higher standard, and there are certain members of this industry that really seek to do that. So we thought we would put those people together in the Options Alliance and create an organization, create a group that indeed held itself to that higher standard. The Options Alliance is a group of individuals from the options industry that have to be in different parts of the industry. Option practitioners, typically independent guys, um, who typically come from the trading floor, but also from different aspects of the business. There are people that are involved in education, some that are on the training side, some on the analytics side. So the Options Alliance now, I think for the first time in history, we're able to bring uh, what were competitors in the trading pits and in the, in the business, now into an open company managers to talk about things that are important to us. Being the good guys in the industry and um, being uh, above the minimum requirements that are required of the various firm uh, individual educators. The Office of Alliance is a group of professional peers who get together to exchange ideas, not competitively but cooperatively. We exchange ideas about what we think what we've seen in the options industry today. To me, the Options Alliance is a long-awaited group of professionals, and it is a solid group of people who care not only about cooperating with each other, not competing with each other, but also their customers. They are all about the integrity of the options industry, They're about trying to make sure that the clients are treated fairly with above board, honest, and real people. So everyone knows that if they become a member of the Options Alliance, there's a very clear code of conduct, a very clear set of membership guidelines that they have to adhere to. And that accomplishes that, that goal of adhering to a higher standard, helping to restore some of the faith, some of the credibility, some of the lost luster that we've seen over the past few years in the options and derivatives market. Join me up here, and I see you've already made it up, Mike and Dan. Can you guys hear us? We don't use the mics, or should we use uh, should we use the mics? I guess we can hear three of them. Yeah, they can hear me. I don't think I have that problem. <laughs> All right, so for this first for this first uh, session, we thought, what better thing to talk about? What better uh, you know, but better group to have uh, than to kind of start highlighting some of the different opportunities uh, that are represented within the Options Alliance and that some of our members uh, have been taking. So we thought we'll have this new panel, and actually I probably should put up our backgrounds while we're doing this, so give me one second. You guys already know mine, but I'll give these guys uh, their due as well. And, um, and we thought what better way than to really highlight some of what the members are doing and kind of learn from their, all, the, all the mistakes and issues and also all the benefits and successes we've had uh, over the years in some of these different representative factions. We thought we'd pick different people who represent some of the different membership classes that we have in the Alliance so you can kind of see firsthand what people are doing and what people are applying that skill set to. Um, there we go. Uh, so we'll start off. 
Uh, we'll go in order, I guess, of, of proximity here. Uh, right here to my right, we have Dan Passarelli. He's the founder of uh, Market Taker Mentoring, another former SIBO guy. We won't hold that against him. And uh, also the author of about, what, 17 books now, uh, including Trading Options Greeks and a few others. And when he's not busy doing that, he's, of course, the, the, the major domo over there at Market Taker Mentoring. Mr. Passarelli, glad you could join us next to him. Uh, we have Mike Cavanaugh. He was the founder of, uh, of Know Your Options, Inc., a former member of the Board of Trade. Uh, and more recently now, he's merged Know Your Options uh, with RCM. He's a principal over there at RCM Asset Management. And down there on the end, uh, joining us all the way from uh, scenic New York, we have good old Mr. Henry Schwartz, another former, you were CBO and probably a couple other exchanges too, right? Uh, in, in between there. Multi okay, so multiple exchanges. We're, we're selling you short here. Uh, and of course, most of you probably know him as the founder of Trade Alert, which is the, the home of those great slides I had there a little bit earlier and kind of the, uh, the source for parsing and analyzing options uh, data. So, you know, I've been talking for a little bit. These guys know my background already. So I thought I'd toss it to each of you guys first. Uh, I'll give you a quick introduction. I'll, I'll let you kind of talk about what you kind of, your background on the floor, what you kind of trade, what you did, and then kind of what you're doing today. Just kind of a brief overview. Maybe Dan will start with you. The microphone should work in front of you. Just, just turn it on. Yeah. It's on there we go. Hello. Uh, so I'm Dan Pasarelli, and I was, uh, I was an equities options mark maker on placebo. Uh, I also traded corn options uh, on the board of trade floor. And about five years ago, from a roundabout sort of way, uh, I ended up starting Market Taker Mentoring. And Market Taker, the whole reason for being of it is to teach mostly retail traders the responsible use of options. How to trade, it, how to trade options without the hype, without um, uh, some of the messages you get in your spam box from uh, other firms that purport to teach people how to trade options. So I've been doing that for about five years and um, recently started a company called Traders Exclusive that uh, is a general website for traders of all asset classes. We don't sell anything on the site, it's just information, videos from the trading floor with trade ideas, educational webinars, and articles as well. Um, that's a little bit about me. Mr. Kavanaugh, same question to you. Just tap that mic button so it turns green if it's already orange. There you go. Got it. Uh, my name is Mike Kavanaugh. I am a principal at RCM Wealth Advisors. And a similar career path as Dan, I started in the industry as a floor trader at the Chicago Board of Trade. Uh, I was in the wheat pit and a uh, as I like to say, did a little time in the third year as well. Um, I left the floor in 2002, so it was just as the electronic markets were emerging in Chicago, uh, they had already happened overseas. In London at the Life Exchange, uh, I had a good friend that I went to school with that was a uh, bond trader who I met at a Christmas party in 2000, and he told me that uh, the wealthiest cab drivers in the world were in London at that time. They used to be bond traders at the Life Exchange. Um, and it's something I should consider. Uh, as 27 years old in 2000, I had to start looking at the future. And as I was taking on more risk on the trading floor, um, and probably like any other floor trader, I have a, a PhD in the School of Hard Knocks. So when we learn to shift, uh, it's usually after a loss. It's like uh, in the airline industry, uh, they learn how to fix the planes and make planes not crash after they crash. Um, traders tend to shift their parameters after they have crashes or, or big losses. So um, as the margins on the floor got thinner and thinner, I left the floor in 2002. Um, I went to a small startup called My Futures Online. Um, I worked in that space for a little while and then started what uh, has now become RCM uh, in 2006, which is uh, what was Know Your Options. It's a registered investment advisor uh, and basically took uh, the risk management skills I learned as a floor trader off of the floor to hedge uh, equity portfolios, portfolios using equity options. Uh, and that slowly evolved into different aspects of the financial services world. Mr. Henry, same question for you, sir. Thank you. Um, my name's Henry Schwartz. Uh, I'm founder of Trade Alert. Uh, my career in options started 25 years ago working for Blair Hall. Uh, I actually got 
pulled into the business because of technology. Basically, I saw the stacks of computers in, you know, we're talking 1986, and was kind of, you know, enamored with the technology. Uh, took a job as a runner, kind of makes us feel just like we're very generic. Was a runner, was a trader, you know, moved on. Uh, but went from Hull on the Placebo to the Amex to the Eurex, where it was electronic, and, and uh, you know, um, kind of kept moving along with that. Uh, worked for three different banks in New York, uh, uh, customer trading and also market making. And then started Trade Alert uh, in 05 after leaving Bank of America, uh, because uh, for two real reasons. One is, uh, I think like a lot of, you know, the reality is this market has evolved and uh, there's not nearly as much uh, money available for the middlemen, uh, for the transactional side of the business. Uh, and I moved into the technology side because uh, because I liked it and because I had to in a way. So now we've been at it for seven years and um, it's, it's kind of great to be serving the industry uh, and make some money at it. Now, I think next I want to I wanna hit on that point that you were just kind of hitting on right now there, Henry. All of us kind of told a little bit about what we do, and then and we said, then we started X. And I think always, the beginning is the most interesting part of the story. It certainly is the most difficult period from launching a new business. So I kind of want to drill down uh, into each of you and see uh, what was that gestation, what kind of led that jump from not just obviously things dwindling, but what led you to identify a need or uh, something that you could fill with what you were doing. I, I'll, I'll, you guys talk, and I'll, I'll get you a chance to think I'll, I'll get the ball rolling. Um, with um, with Insider, it was actually a weird a weird trajectory. I think if you had told me when I was uh, you know a market maker on the Seabolt that I'd be running a, a online content media company you know a decade or so later, I would have said you were crazy. Uh, but it was it was just something that was so far outside of that career path. Uh, and yet, I had always had a bit of a facility for content, particularly on the writing side. It was something I used to do almost for my own uh, kind of. You have to do something to wind down when you get home from the floor. Some guys play golf. Some guys do other things. I used to sometimes write. To, uh, Different things. Sometimes my own edification. Sometimes just articles for publication in various uh, in various pub publications. Just kind of just for something that I like to do. Uh, and it was never anything I, I ever put much thought into. Uh, and then uh, I started seeing all those factors I outlined in my talk about the vanishing bid ask spread, electronic access. All these things were starting to come to bear. Even you know a decade or so ago when I was when I was looking at this stuff. And so I thought, well, it might be interesting to start looking at other ways that I could apply this skill set, but it really didn't, uh, it seemed like outside of the floor there were minimal options, uh, pun intended. And then uh, I, I took a look at the publishing landscape, in particular the uh, the magazine landscape at the time, which was probably about a decade ago, about 2003 or so, and I realized, A, there were not many magazines at all really doing anything with terms of options, most of it was equities, and B, the few that were, they really didn't have, didn't have anyone who had a background in the space who can really kind of provide some sort of uh, insight. So on a lark, I kind of reached out to a few publishers in New York and said, hey, you should have more options content. It was more of just a, a vague admonition than it was, you know, use, me, use my content. But what that ended up leading to was doing some columns for those publications uh, on a monthly basis, mostly equity. And like I said, it was still just a, a, a hobby, a lark, something I did that was fun while I was trading. I never saw it being anything more than that until, as not too long after I started doing that, I started getting calls from other publications saying, uh, we enjoyed this, uh, can you do this or something else? And I, I didn't really realize at the time how kind of, empty and vacant that options content space was, in particular uh, from people with a background in it. It really was a, a kind of a black hole. So almost by default, my stuff started to fill it. And so I started getting a lot of calls uh, for more and more of this type of content at the same time that my market making was dwindling for all of the factors that I just described. And I was taking more and more risk on on a regular basis. And it doesn't take a genius to say, wait a minute, one of these is kind of trajectory down, one of them is heading up. Uh, I should probably try to find a way to make one of these viable. Uh, I still didn't know how to do it. I looked into syndicating my columns in newspapers. That showed how antiquated that idea was. That was still viable a decade ago, but it wasn't very viable, so I, I quickly kiboshed that idea. And then I kind of kept going along, kept trading for a little while longer, and I started looking at the online option space. And that's when I realized kind of the same thing. That it's still, this is about 2006 now, I realized it was still very sparse. And what was there, uh, certainly none of it was free. It was all pretty much paid content or it was an upsell or something else buy my newsletter, buy my guru this, buy my broker services. Uh, so a lot of it was, uh, was, wasn't was free A and B, a lot of it was of dubious quality. People were kind of all the things we talked about before with the Options Alliance, people out there promoting options in, in let's say a less than favorable way or an impractical or an improper way. And I thought 
there was a space, an opportunity for someone with a background in the space who they did it right and they could maybe make it free and open to everybody. And so that was kind of, that was the genesis uh, for Insider. And I'll kind of, uh, I'll let you kind of take the ball and run with it, Dan. There. What was that moment where, when you took, you know, went from the floor and realized, hey, uh, there is an opportunity in them that are educating folks? I fear this might be a, still a little generic. I think we're all going to have some commonality among our answers. Um, but for me, I, it was a confluence of a number of things as well. Um, one, back when it was good to be a market maker, I was one of the people at the firm that I worked for who would sometimes train some of the new traders. So I had an individual uh, who was hired as a clerk, I mean, to be a clerk for a month, and you know, the day he was hired, he applied for membership, and so it was my job in that month to get him ready to be a market maker. And this guy was, I think he was an army ranger or something. It was really like bad mofo, <laughs> you know. And um, I trained him, he was ready, he was really intellectually ready for the job, and he stepped foot in the pit and couldn't open his mouth and didn't become a trader. Instead, he went and taught for uh, for the CEO. He worked for the Options Institute there, which is arguably one of the best educational organizations. Definitely nothing against them. But uh, he worked there for a couple of years and, and had a pretty good career there. So he got called back to the military or something. I don't know. Went to go to the Middle East or something and was leaving the job. Now we kept in touch. And so he called me, or came down to the floor and said, hey listen, I'm, I'm leaving my job. Why don't you take it? Why don't you go and apply for the job at the Options Institute? And I kind of thought, well, that's kind of an interesting idea, you know, but kind of had that market maker bravado. There's those who can do, those who can't teach, you know. So I wasn't really sure that that was for me, but at the same time, there were a couple other things going on. One is, I'd always had some of the passion for writing as well, and I'd written an article for Futures Dance, the first article I wrote, and I, I kind of liked it. And kind of looked at maybe teaching as, as an avenue to do a lot more of that kind of stuff. And of course, at the same time, and I think this is probably gonna be a common thread, business was starting to get kind of tough down on the sea floor. And I had to kind of weigh my options too and, and plan ahead a little bit. Do I want to stick it stick it out here, tough it out? Do I want to evolve? Do I want to do something altogether different? And so I thought more and more about that position, teaching people how to trade options, and I thought, you know what, I'll, I think I'm going to give it a shot. And it turns out I'm really, really glad I did because I kind of see that as my calling. It's something I really, really love to do. And um, feels like a really great way to give back to the trading community that gave me a lot early on. Mike, before we go, I, I forgot to mention, uh, we want this to be an interactive event, so we have the hashtag up there, pound OA13. So if you have questions, a lot of people sometimes are reticent to raise their hands. You can just tweet them with that hashtag, we'll be monitoring it, maybe we can uh, address them during the, uh, the event, or maybe you just say, hey, I'm having a great time. If you're not having a great time, then don't use it by any means. Uh, Mike, <laughs> <laughs> Mike you're, uh, you're up, sir. I think it's a, a constant evolution, you know, once I left the floor. I left the floor in 2002, which was a, a blessing and a curse. Um, there was still some action down on the floor, um, and a couple of people eked out a couple of good years still after 2002. I just saw the writing on the wall, and I was taking on more risk, more risk, less money, less money. So when I left the floor, I went to a, uh, a, a small startup uh, that was an education company basically called My Futures Online and, and we basically wanted to educate uh, online futures trader on what futures were um, and get them comfortable with trading futures online uh, without having to call the floor to go through a broker. They would call us if they, they had the issues but they could log into their own account and uh, trade away. Uh, after I talked to a few people that would call in and you know they would find us on the web uh, I got to talking to people, and what I found was they had no real education on what investing in trading was. So I think the realization came from my understanding of what risk and reward was 
by learning it the, the real way in the, in the trading pits, um, in the difference between losing and making your own money and being able to educate somebody um, when you've been there and done that, uh, and, and you know what the right way is and you know what that should sound like. Uh, it's not somebody that calls in and says, I have $25,000, I want to invest it in futures or stocks or stock options, can I make a million dollars? If I was just a broker doing a disservice to the client or the, the industry in general, I would say, sure, just I'll, I'll have my assistant call you, you can open the account, it'll be open in a day and we can wire the 25 grand in. Uh, that, that's not what I said. I said, sure, you can make a million dollars, can you afford to lose a million and a half? Uh, and that's usually when they say, well, what are you talking about? I want to make money. I said, well, I don't know where you're getting your information, uh, but that, that's not how the system works. It, you put $25,000 into an account and you're trying to make a million dollars, it's unrealistic. And I would try to walk them back. Um, and that's kind of when I realized uh, that there was a, a niche for taking the time to educate somebody. Um, the first time I got it, and I'm very, I'm from Wisconsin and, and the Packers lost last night, so I'm, I'm mourning a little bit, but I really get to go back. <laughs> oh, you're clapping for the Bears. Um, um, what, what I try to do is categorize everything. And, and in, the, in the investing world, what I categorize people into were two categories. The people that called in, I called make-its or keep-its. Um, so there were people that would call in that were trying to make money. And there were people that were calling in that had already made money that wanted to keep their money. Those are the people that I wanted to work with because those were the people that understood how hard it was to make a dollar um, that I had learned in the trading pits on the floor. So. Uh, I guess when it really clicked for me was about 2006, I put together a PowerPoint that I call the three fundamental building blocks of investing and trading, and I just started giving that seminar. Uh, I put it into a webinar, and people started calling me and said, hey, I want to work with you, and I said, well, what does that mean? They said, well, can't you be my broker or advisor? And I said, well, you would pay me for that? And they said, yes. And once I got one or two people to do that, I just started... Um, replicating that and, and scaling that as much as I could. So that was kind of the, the light goes off moment that people really weren't getting an education. And if you took the time to give them the right education and spell it out for them, they wanted to work for you or work with you because they weren't getting that from any of the other shops on the street. Henry, same question for you. You know, you talked a little bit about the gestation of your business, but what was that moment in all those different market making uh, opportunities and roles you had, risk manager, that you said, wow, there really is a need for more analytics in the options data space, and hey, I could fill that. Um, sorry. Um, sure. I mean, as the market as the market evolved, and you know, when I think when I left B of A, there were seven exchanges. Um, and I'm not going to lie and say I left and knew exactly what, what I wanted to do because the truth is my wife was like, let's go do something different, find your passion, all this kind of stuff. I told her my only passion was money, as sad and fucked up as that is. <laughs> and I was not going to open. I looked at a chocolate business in New York. that had been there for 90 years and the, the granddaughter of the founder wanted to sell it. And actually kind of, it was a in, really interesting exercise in analyzing a business. And um, I did get my MBA, so I, I had some clue as to what to do. And we sat down, and you know, it was chocolate. So it was like, you know, even more glamorous than bringing something to a trading floor where everybody's screaming is bring somebody into like your chocolate shop and give them stuff. Um, this lady worked seven days a week, uh, very hard, had 17 employees. Uh, couldn't pay herself during summer because nobody buys chocolate during the summer, and you know squeaked out 150 grand a year for seven days of work, and she could never go on vacation because it was cash business and her employees would steal her money. So, I after looking at that, I said, look, options are what I know, and the that was basically what took me back into it. Um, but what was the, the real genesis on on why analytics and and in, in particular our kind of perspective on option flow analytics was the, you know, as a market maker, you stand there, I mean, especially back in the you know, 90s, and you're as neutral as can possibly be. Uh, you know, what's your market? You know, whatever, 3 to a quarter, you know, then it was 305, 315. 
you don't care if they buy or sell. At least this was how it was droned into my head from, from you know, six years at home. And in fact, if you cared, you got in trouble. Okay, the very last thing that you were allowed to do was be like, ooh, I think this stock's you know, going up and I, I'd much rather buy calls. Um, that risk neutrality and you know, you know, model good prices, you know, make good markets, hedge them, manage your book. Uh, you know, this, you know, for one, it, it, it got harder and harder, as, as everybody said, because because um, you know the, what you were trying to realize there went from you know a quarter to a dime to two pennies. Um, but but the another important part of kind of how the, the world works once I you know once I moved to a bank where you actually had to deal with customers was they don't really like a, a risk neutral valuation. Like you know, give me a quote on these options, you know. Three to a quarter, ten thousand up. But what do you think? What do you mean? I want. I think I want you to sell them to me or buy them from me, and then I want somebody else to do the opposite, and that's <laughs> all I want to happen. Um, but and I mean, Alex Jacobson, who's, who I've known almost for my whole career, knows in the institutional world a lot of what makes you know the world go round is what's your view? What do you think? You know, what's your, what's, your, what's your view on NEQ, the things down, you know, 70% on tweets? Um, and I had no view, okay? There, I was, it was either I'm just so wishy-washy or I, I blame it on my training, but I don't care. I don't care if NEQ's gonna go up or down. I'll give you a good market and I'll hedge it and, and as long as I trade enough, I think I can make money. Um, when I left B of A, we had talked about kind of uh, a project to, to put some of the pieces together to come up with a quantitative view. So, you know, you know, and, and you know, Doris knows this really well because we talk about it all the time. The option flow basically will paint a view, okay? If you see a, you know, a, a boatload of put buyers in Herbalife heading into earnings, there's a view being expressed there. It doesn't matter if that's your view. You know, you, from there you can take it the rest of the way, but you can use all this data, which you know, was exploding in terms of how much there was and how hard it was to assemble, and that was our opportunity. Uh, you can use all this data to come up with a smart, something smart to say to your customer. And that was, that was pretty much something I was never good at, and something that I knew took a very, um, a very you know, kind of purpose-built tool to do, you know, to do well at all, um, and that was what we kind of went for because uh, you know after a few years of just making stuff up, which the salesperson would say, just make something up. <laughs> you know what? They want to know what your view is on Microsoft. Well, then say you like it. Say that it's you know whatever you think. There's support here. It made no sense to me at all, but um, putting some technology into it and some good ideas. Uh, is really what, what we started doing, and it, you know, and it, in the end, it started to help a ton of people that I had, you know, most of whom I had worked with over the years, uh, to, to kind of do their job better, uh, and that was where it came from. Yeah, really quick, too, just to expand on that for a second. I know a lot of people in the group, and maybe some people here as well, who are interested in maybe uh, doing something on the software technology line and some sort of startup in that sense. Uh, did you have a background in coding? Is that something that came naturally to you? Did you outsource all that initial work? Walk us through the actual, you know, mechanics of, of starting up Trade Alert. Uh, I left in 05 and a technologist who I'd worked with at a couple different shops left about three months later. And so we kind of reconnected and both of us were very sour on the banks for a while at least. And um, I didn't do the development. He really was the technology side. I was the... Uh, you know, specking out what the system should do. Um, and then, and, you know, we did it on a shoestring. We, we basically, you know, I mean, you know, we had the luxury of both coming from a bank where we'd been paid enough so that we don't just freak out to not have a job for six months or a year. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, um, I think we, we started developing in April, and in August we had people paying us, a couple floor brokers on the Amex that were just like, yeah, this is just what I need. Um, so that the, the, the negative on that is in April of 05 when we started development, two guys in a little cubicle in one of these rented offices, um, I saw the headlines that YouTube had raised 10 million bucks. And I was like, what, what did they do with 10 million dollars? 
it's like this two of us, you know, Bill and I were like, you know, for a couple hundred grand, we got all the servers we need, we had the contracts to get the market data. I was like, what would you do with 10 million dollars? Like, we would go hire like 400 people? And then, you know, three years later, it sold for a billion dollars, so I got it at that point. But we kind of just did the small, <laughs> we just, you know, we were like, okay, this is what we know how to do. He made it work good enough that I could go show it to somebody and sell it and give them, you know, wrote, write a contract myself. And, you know, it was probably horrible, but at the same time, they paid us and we you know, just kind of had traction. That's the best form of validation. People are actually paying you. You know, your, your business exists and people are actually paying you for it. Uh, I think it's probably something we all have in common here, too, I think, and most of the members in the alliance. Uh, you know, we're going to have a panel later on. It's going to address funding, so I won't get into that too much here. Uh, but I think we all of us pretty much have kind of bootstrapped our own things for the most part, uh, and all the fun uh, that goes along with that in terms of, uh, you know, no money, no salary, and all that fun stuff. But um, let's move on here. Uh, we've already been talking for quite a while, surprisingly. This is a lot of good stuff. We can probably go over in a couple hours on this stuff. But uh, we, have to, we have to move along. How... Um, you know, in addition to starting a business, the other interesting thing I like to see is the evolution. And we talked about the evolution of the options market earlier, how this space has evolved, how the trajectory to get into it, and more importantly, now get out of it, has evolved. Um, what is, you know, for us, you know, for, I know personally for me, Insider has evolved quite a bit since I launched it. Uh, and I'm curious to hear from you guys as well uh, what and how your business evolved, maybe in some... Uh, surprising ways compared to when you started it and what it is now. Maybe Dan, we'll, we'll start with you. I guess really just at the heart of that question is um, always striving to get better at what you're doing. Um, when I first started trading, I, I used to trade for Fawcett, late Steve Fawcett. And um, he was noted as saying at some point that uh, you know, he'd been trading for 20 years at that point and was Incredibly successful, and he said, "I'm still trying to learn to become a better trader." And you know, I think that's a really, really good life lesson in any business that you're in, and that sure held true for doing what I'm doing. I mean, when I first started in the education business, sometimes I'd see some other mark maker, just like myself, leave the floor and say, "Well, you know, I'm going to start an education business too." At first, I was kind of like, well, oh, yeah, you know, you don't want to do that, you know. <laughs> um, but now, five years later, after having gotten some traction on my business myself, when I hear people say that, I'm like, yeah, come on in, the water's fine. <laughs> because it's, it took me, not just in the life of my business itself, a while to really evolve and to really get good at my craft. At, at this business, but I had a few serendipitous uh, roads leading to starting my business where I learned a whole ton about how to market an education business and everything that goes along with it. So um, I guess, yeah, I guess that's the main hurdle, just trying to keep getting better at what I do. And, this feels so meta. I'm sitting here reading people's tweets and retweeting while I'm on a panel. It seems, it seems <laughs> odd. How the how web 2.0 of us. Um, but, you know, don't give up for a second yet, Dan, because I, I have something else I want to hit on. Uh, I know, Dan, now you're, you're dying to go. But uh, you mentioned something earlier that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, I've had maybe unwittingly the evolution of your business now. You have the publishing side as well now, which is kind of affiliated. I, we're seeing a lot of educators taking that step now, that leap, not just from education, but into the publishing side as well, something obviously I'm very familiar with, having started just in the publishing and avoided the education earlier altogether. Uh, but why why did you feel it necessary to take that leap? Uh, was it something you felt was additive to the educational business or something you just wanted to you wanted to expand in that direction and you know, don't see them related? What, walk us through that decision. Well, I, I think there were a number of reasons. And, and Mark's referring to my other company, uh, Traders Exclusive, talk to individuals about that later, and I've got some information at my table in the back of the room. And I, I mean, I think a number of things led to starting Traders Exclusive, and um, part of it is to be able to work with other people in the business that just me as an education firm, I typically wouldn't work with. Like, for example, other educators who are in similar businesses to mine, as a direct competitor of, you know, 
point you that I don't really necessarily want to help support you. But when I have a different business, that's kind of a media firm, I guess. I mean, it's an educational and, and a news website. I'm able to work with people who typically would be competitors that I otherwise wouldn't work with, and, and you know, a lot of the good people in this room in, in the alliance. And I personally can't stand it. I don't know how you got on the channel, sir. All right, yeah, hand that mic off, hand off, off to my Ethan <laughs> Champ and a bit there. Mr. Cavanaugh, same uh, same question for you. How has obviously you've had a lot of evolutions uh, in your business. So maybe walk us through some of those. Some you planned, some you didn't, and kind of how they how they've impacted you and you dealt with them. Yeah, you know the. The evolution, and to take it one step back, I mean, they made it really easy for me when I was on the floor. I, I stood in between a buy broker and a sell broker and could see the orders coming in and out of the pit. So I call that informational edge, and I just, you know, I paid a, a high monthly lease price at the Board of Trade to, to get that informational edge. But it was very easy, and at a young age, I had had some success. So translating that when I left the floor, it didn't come as easy. Um, so the evolutions were, um, I had to admit I didn't know everything. Um, I had to ask people for advice. So I think one of the bigger evolutions I had, and it took a while because I'm slow, I'm from Wisconsin. Um, the, the evolution of admitting you don't know what you don't know and then seeking advice from others that have been there. Um, so people that have, are leaving the floor or you know whether they're starting a new company it's in trading or not in trading um, if they ever ask me for advice the first piece of, of advice I give them is don't be afraid to ask for help um, and the second piece of advice is make sure you're asking the right people um, for that help uh, that was probably one of my biggest evolutions over the years is just um, knowing that you don't know everything and knowing when and where to go for the help that you need and not help like the four letter word help or help I'm drowning in the middle of the ocean help but hey I've got this situation in my job um, I don't I've never confronted it before I know that you're in the same industry what would you do uh, and if you have a mentor or somebody in the industry that does something similar to you that you can confide in um, that's probably been the biggest evolution I've had in business Mr. Henry, same for you. And obviously, since I first met you all those years ago when we launched Insider, uh, and how far Trade Alert and your affiliated properties have come, there's been quite a bit of evolution there. You know, kind of walk us through why you've decided to do some of that and, and the need and the, and the benefit behind it. Sure, and Marco, I want to thank you for, I never knew how the hashtag thing worked, but now, <laughs> now I get it. There you go, you get the live feedback while you're up there. It's almost distracting, but it's fun. And they're IPO in the next, yes. in, on the 15th, right? Um, you know, it, it, evolution, I mean, technology, is, as probably everybody in this room knows, it's it kind of insane how quickly things evolve, you know, from, you know, people just pricing out combos on the floor to sheets to big screens to touch screens to pumping quotes, you know, that's, that's the evolution that, you know, we've all seen. Um, you know, for us, the evolution, you know, we don't have a choice. Um, you know, at least systems-wise, you know, my, my my wife always asks me like, why do you why do you still why do you still have to have three developers? Isn't it done? You've been at this for seven years, <laughs> crying out loud. I, like I wish it was done, but it's never done. It's a horse race, you know, in you know really any technology, but derivatives especially because um, you know as soon as you kind of chill back and you know think you're just going to collect all the all the checks, you know, things are changing, you know, they're coming up with new exchanges, they're coming up with weeklies and hourlies and, you know, all sorts of stuff that you have to kind of keep working on to help people. Um, and that's kind of the easy side in a way, because your customers will tell you, uh, you know, how am I supposed to, how can I price an OTC? I'm like, oh, well, yeah, we, could, we could come up with something like that. Um, and right now we're working on some very cool stuff to kind of capture spreads and complex orders the way they're really trading. Um, evolution of the business itself is, is you know, really, you know, like, like these guys are saying, it's really hard. You, you really have to, you know, you have to have a game plan and, you know, 
you know, making a system and making it work and saying, oh, I want the menus to look like this, that's really very easy. Um, you know, whether you outsource it, you know, and have somebody build it for you or, or figure it all out. But um, trying to figure out what is this really going to evolve into um, down the road is, is probably the toughest thing. And, and I do think it's very important to uh, try to find some people that have been down the road because, you know, in, in a way, the mistakes you'll make there are so much bigger than, uh, you know, coming up with a, a, some command that nobody likes. Big deal. You get rid of it. Um, but really, you know, trying to figure out what's, what's the plan from, you know, do your business plan, uh, do your research, decide what you're going to do, make it, sell it, collect some money, do the rest of the, the you know, kind of busy work to put the business together. That's, that's all kind of easy. Um, the kind of strategy of like, what is this, how do I get out of this in the end? Or what does it really turn into? Um, it's the hardest thing, and, and I'm not very good at it. Uh, myself, but uh, it is, it's crucial to try to find a, somebody who's kind of been down, if not the same road, a similar road, um, so you can, you know, evolve, because, you know, the reality is, is you know, as, as Mark was saying, if this equity derivatives business is, is uh, you know, it's shrinking, the, the numbers don't show it, the volume's, you know, really pretty healthy, uh, but the number of human beings that are employed in options trading, uh, I guarantee you is about down about 30% uh, over the last five years. Because I know how hard it is for us to find people that are trading. Um, so, you know, evolution, it, for us especially, is like, okay, so, you know, if, if we thought there were 2,000 sales and trading professionals out there that was our kind of target customer base, now there's only 1,500 or 1,000. What else is going on? Like, you know, what other market segments can you evolve into? And that's really... Um, that's important, and and you know, for us, it's kind of like we, we got a nice recurring core business, and we have you know, so we can experiment without feeling like we're we're you know, our backs against the wall, um, and then we can try to move forward on things that you know that make the most sense. Uh, you know, for us, I just want to hit on it really quick because I know a lot of guys in the group and here now are, are becoming publishers or thinking about doing it, and you know, we were very early movers in that space, so we had some advantage. Uh, we and we were also very early in uh, that display as our primary model in the option space. Anyway, it had been done to death in other industries for years. Uh, but for us, taking it into options, particularly in that in that early period when I was still coming up with the idea in mid to late 2006, and I was going on the door, knocking on the door of exchanges and trading firms, and saying, "Hey, uh, do you want to sponsor an options website? Here's what a banner is." Uh, and then they would say, well, what are you selling? And I would say, we're selling nothing. And they would, they could not wrap their heads around that. Um, so that was a lot of conversation. But even still, uh, we, we've seen other players enter the publishing side now and adopting that model. And that's kind of fine. It's how the space evolves. Uh, our business has really evolved in some interesting ways since then. I know when we launched it, we also launched it with this, I had this weird little idea, because I've always been a bit of a technophile. But I thought, well, why don't we try this audio version of the content, too? This is pre-iPhone. This is pre-everything else. Uh, so we were, I think, a little bit too far ahead of the curve on these things called podcasts. So I was going around the same time I was knocking on doors in mid-2006 to say, hey, do you want to sponsor a website? I'd also say, do you want to sponsor a podcast? And I would get these looks like, that. What, what language are you speaking? That makes no sense. Um, so we started calling it radio. That was an evolution for us. And over the years, actually, um, that has become a predominant part of our business, you know, too much so to the point where I see a lot of people coming into the publishing side of the space now and saying, I'm going to do what you did. I'm going to launch a website and I'm going to put display on it and that's going to be my business. And then they say, well, I can't make money on that. And I say, well, no, that business has evolved. If I was going to do anything differently now today, I would never launch with a display as my primary business. And then B, I think a lot of people too, when they get into the publishing side of the space, they say, I'm going to put up great content and then I'm going to let the other side of it kind of take care of itself. Um, and they don't think they realize what goes into making that latter part actually operate. You know, when I was building our launching Insider, I spent a good six months, like I said, knocking on doors and talking to people and saying, here's what I'm planning to do. Uh, here's how it could benefit you. And then working with them. A lot of them exchanges who still saw their websites then as only entities for members. It was not for the public. So they would never want to promote it because why would they want anyone coming to the SIBO or the ISC or whatever other website if it was not for the public? Um, and so getting over that mindset took a lot of time. And so it's been a, a lot of time that we invested in the model itself, not just in the site. I see a lot of publishers now coming to the space and thinking they can replicate that. And then they realize how hard it is uh, to actually do that. And they don't put the actual work 
in on, on the actual model side as much as they do on the content side of the book. And if you're content A, but B, if you don't have a way to, to build it and drive it and support it, then uh, everything else is kind of for naught. Um, I don't want to go on to the other panel, but we have a couple of other things I want to hit on here too. Uh, let's get on, I think we probably can all write a book, maybe a collective book, maybe it's a good idea, I like it. Uh, what the training floor didn't teach us, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that book. Uh, I think for all of us probably, one of the number one things, and certainly for me, uh, coming from trading and market making, uh, you're taught very early to keep your cards close to your vest. Uh, you had, we had, we weren't brokers, we had no public customers, so the notion of going out and getting customers, that sales, marketing, promotion, PR, all that kind of stuff, was very much anathema to me when I left the floor. And a lot of market makers still have that issue with that day. It's very much a fundamental change of mindset. Uh, so I think for all of us, that probably would be up there. And it's so important, in fact, that we have a great panel on it later today, our third panel with people who are much more qualified to talk about that than me, getting into all this kind of stuff about how that is. So we're gonna, I think we'll table the sales and marketing talk because that's a whole other conversation uh, that I'm looking forward to getting into. But maybe aside from that, what other things did the trading floor not teach you? Maybe we'll, we'll mix it up. Henry, we'll go with you first this time. Sorry, sorry to reach you there. Um, I mean, the great thing about the floor, besides that it was a very fun place to spend a day, um, was that you made your money or lost your money, but the, their feedback was kind of instant. And you know, you went home. I mean, maybe you lost some sleep over some sort of downside put position, but you weren't really thinking out. At least I wasn't. You know, I wasn't thinking out six months. I wasn't thinking out, you know, certainly three or four years. Uh, so I mean, I think that the, the floor, you know, and trading in general is a very hand-to-mouth business, um, and it doesn't. It really doesn't prepare you for kind of a longer, the bigger picture stuff. I guess that's the, that's the big, the biggest thing. You have to kind of think in a in a bigger picture, longer longer time frame aspect. Mr. Kavanaugh, there's probably easier to say what it taught you. There's probably so much that the floor um, didn't teach me. Um, I think the floor, though, and, and I'll tweak the answer a little bit. Um, I think when, when I left the floor, I looked at it as an, a novelty at a cocktail party that I could say I was a floor trader. Um, and it's a book you could put on your coffee table and now they've got a couple movies out that you can email your friends and maybe there's a snippet in the movie with you know, your arms up but with a picture of your face on the movie. And, and that's what I thought the floor was when I left the floor, that it was a novelty item. Um, I didn't realize the analytical skills um, that I picked up on the floor and later could transfer until I did, I mean, obviously left the floor, but it just took a while to realize that, hey, um, the, the risk management in successful traders, you weren't really pounded, you, that wasn't pounded into your head, um, uh, so you can communicate that to the, to the general public. Um, but that's really what the success on the floor was about, were the people that could assess and manage risk. Um, in the... There, there was nobody down there saying, hey, you know what you're doing right now? You're assessing and managing and risk. And, and that's a very transferable life skill in just about every business line out there. You didn't have like a, a, a guidance counselor on the floor. So you actually learned a lot on the floor, uh, but didn't really know you were learning a lot on the floor until you left and then you had to think about it. Um, so I would say I learned a lot, that it taught you a lot, but it didn't teach you that you actually learned this stuff. There was nobody raising their hand saying, all right, what we just learned here in class was how to lose $40,000 by not listening uh, this morning in, uh, in class. You know, if you were to, if you were to listen to it, you shouldn't trade vol on the open when, uh, after an ag report. You know, there wasn't anybody saying that. You taught it to yourself, and when you had a really bad day, however you coped, you coped. Some people went to the gym, some people went to the bar. Uh, some people did whatever they did, but there was never anybody pointing that out to you from a professorial or mentorial like area. You know, I was backed by a large wheat trader. He was Irish like me, and when we had a ba bad day, he'd be like, ah, let's go to the bar. You know, and, and that was like the mentorship you got. But when you look back at that, uh, that was, you know, what would be now is, hey, uh, let's go into the conference room. Uh, let's break out the, the whiteboard, and uh, let's look at how to uh, open up a new vertical uh, with this client base. You know, it might be different, but it's the same thing. And I think not knowing how to transfer all that stuff you learned uh, immediately, and it took time, uh, was probably the biggest lesson that I learned, or didn't learn, or I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Passarelli, sir. Uh, 
as far as what I didn't learn on the trading floor, I don't think I knew any words that had more than five letters until I left the trading floor. <laughs> Most of them had exactly four letters. Um, <laughs> Oh, you can sit on that one. <laughs> <laughs> if I wait long enough, somebody will laugh. Um, no, you know, I think one of the biggest things is um, self-promotion. When you're down on the trading floor, and for those of you who were not market makers, maybe you're not aware of how this works, but if you're standing in a trading pit and you're having a great year and you're just printing money and you're making a ton of money and somebody comes up to you, another market maker, and says, Hey, uh, I was trading in that pit. You, you guys making any money? Oh, no. No, it's, it's pretty good. You should go try the pit next door. I think they're a lot better. <laughs> you know. But uh, when you try to run a retail business, you know, it's a little different. You kind of have to um, you have to engage in shameless self-promotion. And two, also you mentioned, I think two, I think, I think for a lot of people, an interesting challenge coming into your line of work, the educational space is, you're going from market maker trading ball to all of a sudden you have all this, in your case, and a lot of educators, retail clientele. Uh, so maybe walk us through how that's a huge mindset shift in and of itself to start thinking like them and away from the way you used to trade on the floor. Yeah, it really was. And I think Mike alluded to this in one of your comments. You know, on the trading floor, you trade very, very differently than a retail trader. And I spent seven years as a market maker down the board and that was my day-to-day -day operation, was trading volatility, uh, trading the bid-ask spread. And then I left the floor and figured, well, yeah, it's the same thing. You know, it's just there's not as many people around. And it's very, very different. So I kind of really, I kind of had to reteach myself to, to trade as a retail trader. As somebody who takes the offer or hits the bid instead of being the person who makes that market. And um, that, that, was, that was a different evolution. I mean, definitely you learn everything you need to down on the trading floor in order to be a good retail trader, but you sure have to think a whole lot differently about it. I know we're running a little bit long. I want to make sure the next panel has some time. Some of you have tweeted some great questions. Maybe we'll have a chance to answer them uh, in between. Uh, you know, really quick, we'll have a couple of our last topics really quickly, then we'll wrap up. Um, I think for a lot of us, we've talked personally amongst the group as well, uh, just how being you know an entrepreneur now how that mindset differs from uh, from the day-to-day -day of used to be a market making a trader you know we've all just joked about how you know a lot of people got into this business because they like to come in on the early train and then leave at one uh you're not going to do that too much when it's your own business now it's a 24 7 thing uh and for a lot of us you know and for a lot of people in the audience and in the, in the group you know it, it probably makes sense to if you're thinking about you know, looking at the future uh, of market making maybe there's some other area you could apply that to or also you know it's good to start thinking now about you know these kind of things before you have no choice uh, and you have to uh, you have to uh, start thinking about these things because your your other business is taking away from you. All right, but uh, really quick, guys, let's go through um, some some key lessons, some key takeaways we want to leave people with before the, uh, the next panel starts. Uh, something that you know you've learned or that has benefited you uh, post leaving the floor and starting your business that you think will will resonate here today. Dan, we'll start with you. Um, I mean, I, I really think that uh, you kind of touched on what I think one of the biggest things is, and, and that there is not an opening bell and a closing bell anymore. You know, this Friday, um, I had to come home and have a 10.30 Skype meeting with people. You know, I was like out to, with my family, you know, my son had a band concert or something, and uh, I had to come home and work on Friday night to have a call with people because that's the only time I can squeeze it in and then wake up early in the morning on Saturday, you know. So it's a, it's a different lifestyle. I, I, as I understand it, this is kind of how most people live their lives. It's, it's, it's not like, you know, you go down and there's an open bell and a closing bell. Yeah, it, it, it's a great point, the, the no opening bell, no closing bell. Um, I'm kind of going through an evolution right now in our business in financial services that, um, you know, I'll leave people with, with the idea. Um, we were having a difficult time bringing in new clients, you know, after the uh, uh, John Corzine's little stunt and his help from Madoff before that building, you know, solid uh, integrity like uh, MO in the financial services business. Um, 
it, it's really hard to bring new customers in to a company that manages people's money if you don't have their trust. So it takes time to develop trust and you can't manufacture or scale trust. So what we learned and shifted and pivoted, um, and it wasn't fun for about a year and a half, um, going out and doing speaking engagements and events and not seeing any results from it. So we made a pivot and a shift to, uh, instead of trying to get new clients, we opened up new services to our existing clients. So uh, we were doing, just as a registered investment advisor, a couple of different strategies. Now we've got an introducing broker, we've got a private equity division, we do business consulting, we've been growing uh, a lot in the 401k management space. Um, so my biggest, like if you leave with one thing, you gotta have fun. And for the last you know, year and a half, it wasn't fun, up to about six months ago. It wasn't fun because we were trying very hard to bring in new clients and we made a pivot and all of a sudden everything was fun again. So uh, the term entrepreneur, and I'm gonna try to trademark this, I'd like to change to entrepreneur. You, you've gotta make sure you're having fun at what you do because it, it, makes, a, it makes a giant difference. So people came here for quality puns. Yes. Uh, Mr. Henry, take us home, sir. I don't, I don't have any puns. Um, my two kind of real lessons that I've learned is, first of all, is, is try to hire the best people you can hire. Even if you're just hiring a couple, um, don't be afraid to hire people that are smarter than you. Um, you're going to be stuck with the person you hire for a while. It's really hard to get rid of people. It's it's. You know, it, it's not, you gotta, you gotta put the work into it and um, try to get somebody really, really good. Um, the, other, the other lesson that I'm constantly reminding myself is uh, to try to work on the business and not in the business. It's very easy to make yourself a job. It really, really is. The lady with the chocolate shop made herself a job. Uh, if you can't try to get out of that day-to-day -day junk, at least, Part of it. You're going to want to do everything yourself because you're not going to have any money to pay people. Um, but you have to, you know, you can spend days and days and weeks and weeks. And I mean, and, you know, we're, we're in our seventh year of Trade Alert, and there's still junk that I do that I'm like, man, you know, why am I still inputting checks into QuickBooks? Like, it's got to be, this is like an hour of my day, which is nice because it checks, but <laughs> still, it's like you get stuck into that reactive mode and you, you know, months go by and you're like, dang, you know, everything's okay, you know, and, and maybe it's fun, which is definitely, I agree. Uh, but you got to kind of try to look at it as like, you know, you know, even if you're not trying to build it to sell, you know, how turnkey can you get this thing? Because that will let you say, you know what, I'm going to be gone for three months. And, you know, I think that you guys can make it work because if there's little pieces that you're the only one that knows how it works, um, then you put yourself a job, and you know the reality with that is that when you leave, there's going to be a huge cost to somebody else, uh, you know, and a huge cost to your pocket basically because the business isn't finished. Um, so you got to you got to work on the business, not in the business, as much as you possibly can. All great points. I want to thank you guys for joining us. We'll have a few minutes to uh, take a little break. I'll play another little video of the Options Alliance, and then our next panel is going to come up here with some more uh, great points on those exact same topics. So uh, thank you. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.